the, the sea of yellow and blue covering Europe is a hypocritical sea. This is my number one accusation. In other words, what do I mean by that? That while most of the people who go out there and demonstrate are very well-meaning, this, if you look at it as a movement, this movement does not really have the interests of Ukrainians in their heart as a movement, not as individuals participating in these events. What do I, do I mean by this? Frank, you asked me, what is the only possible solution now? And there aren't many. There's only one. There are two options. One is a tragic one, a quagmire, a kind of Afghanistan, a permanent conflict, something between Afghanistan and Cyprus on, this, uh, uh, on the eastern flank of, of, of Europe. Uh, you know, a slow burning, maybe not that slow burning, permanent conflict of a divided country with armies of occupation, with uh, expropriation here, there, everywhere. This is, you know, a catastrophe. It's a catastrophe for Ukraine. It's a catastrophe for our comrades in Russia who happened to be... DiEM25, Edge knows that. We have comrades, as we speak now, I'm not going to mention their names for obvious reasons, who are in prison, being tortured by Putin's henchmen for having demonstrated in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. There are particular persons that, you know, occupy my soul and my mind almost every day because I know what they're going through. The reason why I'm saying that, you know, the West, NATO, the, our, the powers that be, our governments, are hypocritical about the Ukrainians is because the only alternative to this quagmire is a meeting between Biden and Putin. Nothing else will will sort this out, whereby there is an agreement of the two superpowers, because you know, there are no other powers in Europe. The European Union is a figment of our imagination, doesn't exist geostrategically. It is simply the tail that the NATO wog wags. Uh, so imagine, the only thing that could happen is Moscow and Washington could, could come to an arrangement with Zelensky agreeing to it, and with the European Union playing an auxiliary role, uh, role, mainly financing, that there's going to be something that Putin can proclaim to be a victory mm. and something that the West can proclaim the victory. And a solution that leaves everybody slightly dissatisfied, but in the end spares the people of Ukraine. And what would that solution be? It's really very straightforward. Cessation of uh, the conflict, removal of the Russian troops, an independent, neutral Ukraine along the lines of Austria. We can discuss possible association with the European Union, like Austria had one during the Cold War. Regarding the Donbas area, you can have something like the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland, which creates checks and balances, a kind of joint sovereignty, the same way that Northern Ireland has enjoys joint sovereignty by London and Dublin with EU money and uh, investment, something like that in the Donbass area to guarantee the rights of Ukrainian speakers, Russian speakers. Crimea can be kicked into the, into the long grass and can be put on the shelf to discuss, you know, in a thousand years again. Uh, <laughs> that would be a solution that Putin would take to his own folks, the KGB, FSB, you know, oligarchs, whatever, and say, look, I won. What did I want? To end the eastward expansion of NATO. Yeah. I succeeded. And I've denazified Mariupol, you know, the Azov battalion, go to hell, Nazis, anyway. Right? So he can, he can, he can proclaim his own victory. We can pro proclaim our own victory that, you know, Russian troops are out and they didn't destroy the sovereignty of Ukraine and the Ukrainians can live in peace. And if the Europeans really mean their commitment to the Ukrainian people, you know, stop painting everything yellow and blue send them 100 billion euros mm -hmm. and rebuild the bloody country. And you know what? Something else. How about wiping out the $97 billion of public debt that the Ukraine owns to Western banks? If you really want to be solidar solidaristic, do that. They are not doing any of that. My suspicion, it's a suspicion, I cannot prove it. History will tell is that this is a solution President Zelensky really, really aches for. He really wants it. He's already mentioned four days ago that he no longer wants the Ukraine to be part of NATO. He's already mentioned that there can be an arrangement about Donbass. 
and that Crimea can be discussed later. I said a thousand years, he said later. My great fear is that when Putin is ready, following the very brave resistance of Ukrainians who've inflicted heavy losses on his army and so on, when he's ready to sign such an agreement, Washington DC will torpedo it. Because the United States of America are great beneficiaries from this war, and, they, and there are elements, I'm not saying that everybody in, the, in Washington is like this, but there are elements, powerful elements within the military industrial complex and the fracking oil and gas industry, especially in Texas and New Mexico, who are loving this. They're called they are, donors. Donors. Well, you know, Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor of Germany, announced that he's going to buy 100 billion euros worth of equipment from America, you know? And similarly, and at the same time, they are already negotiating for LNG, liquid, um, liquefied natural gas, to be transported from Qatar and primarily Texas, fracked gas, to new terminals in Hamburg, where you are. <laughs> okay? Well, I'm so, always in shitty situations, yeah. <laughs> This is my fear. My fear is that, you see, and so they are the ones who are participating in this yellow and blue wonderful sea <clears throat> of support, of solidarity with Ukraine. But in the end, you know, the powers that be behind supporting and creating the circumstances, as Etcher put it very, very well, you know, this, this, this um, resonance between uh, people that are solid solidaristic with an invaded country and the powers that be the media, the establishment, yeah? that those powers that be really do not have the interests of Ukrainians in their mind. And you can see that when, you know, when I stood up in Greek parliament and generally around Europe, and I've been, I advocated the Austria solution, you know, a democratic, independent, but neutral, non-NATO country, I was immediately hounded. I had the former prime minister of Finland coming out and lambasting me for being Putin's useful Idiot, yeah. You know, to quote uh, Brian, Brian, or misquote him, okay? Uh, because I was talking about the neutral Ukraine. So these people are prepared to sacrifice the people of Ukraine on the altar of maintaining their theoretical right to be a member of NATO. These wars, imperialist wars, because this is a typical First World War type of imperialist war. Two imperialist sides clashing with, you know, huge numbers of victims on both sides. Um, they have a, a tradition of dividing the left. Remember how the Second International was destroyed by the Great War. The Social Democrats in Germany took the side of the German government, the nationalist government. Uh, some Russians took the side of the Tsar. And we split between the second and third international. I don't think that, that the left ever recovered from that split between social democrats and Bolsheviks. We never recovered. And now we have something like that. I have been personally attacked, personally attacked. Uh, Noam Chomsky has been attacked. Uh, Naomi Klein has been attacked. I'm sure you will be attacked very soon <laughs> if you haven't already been uh, by left wing comrades in Eastern Europe, in particular in Poland, for something called West Splaining. It's a, mm -hmm. it, yeah, uh, it's, it's a form of mansplaining. That is, I've been accused of condescendingly telling Eastern Europeans what is in their interest. Now, that's a very big accusation, right? Uh, if it were true, it, it, I've been accused of denying them agency, of saying that, it, as Rogers has said, that it is in the interest of the West and of the East and of everybody to resolve this situation now with a neutral Ukraine solution and, you know, these comrades, former comrades, actually, um, they don't want to consider themselves to be my comrades. So that's why I'm saying I would like them still to be my comrades, but they don't want to. So I'm not going to impose my comradeship upon them. Uh, they are saying that, oh, you are denying us agency uh, and you are imposing upon us on the, in the East your Western left-wing fixation with NATO and the Americans. We care only about uh, being defended from Russia. Now, I understand that if you're Polish, you have a very long history of being fucked over by Russia, by Russian occupiers. Excuse my non-scientific language. Um, and, you know, and I can understand why we have different perspectives. You know, I grew up in a fascist dictatorship sponsored by NATO. They grew up in a communist dictatorship sponsored by the Warsaw Pact. 
So, you know, difference of opinion and perspectives and sensibilities are absolutely understandable. What is not understandable, I don't think, is um, to be told that, you know what, uh, we Eastern Europeans know better about Eastern Europe. Uh, a majority wants us to be in NATO, in the Ukraine, in Poland. So who are you to tell us that we, we shouldn't be in NATO? Well, it's me. I mean, my name is Yanis, and I'm telling you that you're wrong. In the same way that when I speak to Greeks, if the Greeks, you know, if somebody shows me an opinion poll that 70% of Greeks want to be in NATO, I don't give a damn. I will say that 70% of Greeks are wrong. And nobody's going to deny me the right to be critical of a majority that has been formed through a kind of propaganda process. That's why we're in the left. We're not going to stop being left wing <laughs> because the majority have been influenced by the right. Okay, and I'm not going to shut up about my views regarding Poland. I will not be condescending to my Polish or Ukrainian comrades. I am not going to pretend that I know better than them about what's good for them. But they are not, not going to say to me that I don't have the right to speak about, you know, Poland being or Ukraine being in NATO. This is the basis of internationalism. And if we of the left forfeit the very principle of internationalism, that, you know, when we speak about Burkina Faso or Nigeria, or New Jersey, or Greece, we all have an opinion because we are all citizens of the world. This is what we are as Europeans, as people of the world, as Africans, as Indians, as communists, as socialists, as, you know, progressives. I would be let too. me give you an example. Let, let me give you a tangible example, right? For a week now, Brian and Ed and Roger and Frank, you know, they have been ministers of defense of the European Union, have been locked up in a room trying to come up with a plan for a European army, okay? Which, of course, you know, we could have told them it can't work. Why? Because let's say we have a European army. Let's say we create a, a strong, you know, 300,000 men and women European army. Who is going to send them to war? We don't have a government. We do not have a European government. You know, Ursula von der Leyen, right, can, doesn't even, con, con, you know, um, have authority within her block of flats. Um, she's a failed minister of defense from Germany who is now in Brussels. Nobody pays attention to her. She cannot send 300,000 men and women to war. Who's going to do it? Macron. He, can, yeah, he, he cannot con, you know, command German and Greek and Italian soldiers. We don't have a government, so we cannot have a European army. So you know what happened? After a week of these deliberations, they decided they are going to form a 5,000 strong uh, rapid deployment force. And then when our journalists said to them, so what will this rapid, where are they going to be deployed? How will they be deployed? Well, they had, of course, to say that they cannot be deployed um, at the front, any front, not the Ukrainian front, any front, because nobody can command them. So you know what? In the end, they had to admit that their job will, description will be to evacuate, ev evacuate EU diplomats and personnel from EU embassies in case of conflict. You know, <laughs> that was great in the EU over the last week. <laughs> yeah. So we don't have any hope. He's listening to this and he's laughing his head off. And so is, of course, Biden. And so is, of course, China. Because the European Union is a big, stupid continent. We need to exploit the divisions between big capital. Because, you know, the, the companies that make weapons and the companies that frack gas and oil in Texas, they want the war to continue. And they're very powerful. But there are others that don't want it, like Google, for instance, or um, Apple. They're not happy with this because they are, their sales and profits are going down as a result of um, the disruption of trade. So isn't so that interesting, though, that the ones who want it are the ones who are making money and the ones who don't want it are the ones who make more money if it's not. We, we need to turn them against each other. We need to find, to exploit these fissures and the conflicts and uh, between capitalists. How can that, that be done? Very skillful left wingers. Well, this <laughs> is one of the stalwarts of the establishment in the United States. You know, a geostrategic, a geostrategic thinker. You know, cold warrior, Atlanticist, always on the side of evil. Thomas Friedman, mm -hmm. the, yeah. the the you know the the columnist of New York Times. Yeah, he's come out with what we're saying. He's come out with what we're saying. Kissinger really? himself has come out 
with what we're saying. You know, we are on the same side as Kissinger. That's enough for me to to contemplate suicide, right? Um, but but you can see that there are these people who are calling for um, caution. They are very worried about something else. They are very worried that what they are doing in the context of the economic war against Russia is going to be the end of the exorbitant privilege of the American dollar. Uh -huh. Because think about it. They, they use the nuclear weapon, financial nuclear weapon, a weapon of mass financial destruction. Uh, and, and I have to say I was surprised because I wasn't expecting them to do it. Okay, it wasn't the sanctions about oil and stuff. You know, they are already, as we speak, you know, they're paying Russia $700 million a day. The West is paying, as we speak, you know, for gas and oil. So, you know, this, this is a hypocrisy. But there's one thing that they did, which was a nuclear financial weapon. They cut off the Russian central bank from the international yeah. system of central bank payments. Yeah. Now, that yeah. is big. Because as we speak, the central bank of Russia has $800 billion dollars in the bag, or in the proverbial bag, to which they do not have access. They have, Russia has debts that are maturing, bonds that are maturing as we speak, that are owned by Dutch, German, French, British banks. So essentially, Washington and the West, but Washington, is forcing the Russian central bank not to pay to default on debts that it has to the West. That is creating serious problems. Uh, there may be a Lehman's moment, maybe not, but whether there is one or not. Okay. Over the last three years, the Chinese Central Bank, the Central Bank of China, of the People's Republic, created an alternative, a NIMBY based digital currency, which is speak and span. It's beautiful. I mean, technically, it's it's wow, but of course it's like a huge mo motorway without cars, because they built the system, but nobody's using it. Everybody's using the dollar system. But as of last week, the Russians have been using it yeah. uh, to 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 sell oil to China. China has increased by fifty percent its sale of energy, sorry, its importation of energy from Russia. So this big highway technological digital highway for payments that the Chinese have built three years ago and which were they were beta testing with 100 million Chinese people. <laughs> now, okay, uh, is being used by Russia. So Russia is selling energy to China. It is getting all these digital one, Remnimbis, digital Chinese currency. But then it uses the same system to buy stuff from India, bypassing the dollar payment system. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the people like Thomas Friedman in the New York Times is freaking out because he can see that this is undermining the exorbitant privilege of the dollar. And he says, what the hell are we doing here? Mm -hmm. You know, from an Atlanticist, right-wing, capitalist, American perspective. Yeah. So there are these issues.